Many years later, a new group of invaders from the north, led by the Roman general Pompey, will appear and they will do as they please for a long time. No one will be able to stand against them. They will eventually establish themselves as a military force all over the world, including the glorious land of Israel, and they will have the power to destroy anyone rebelling against them. The Roman army gained many victories under the leadership of Pompey in the northern kingdom. The Jews in Palestine resisted him for a three-month period after which Jerusalem was captured and the walls broken down. Rome was never really a republic even though it was so far as form was concerned. However, as the republic proved ineffectual, there was a period of time in which Rome was ruled by three individuals, Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus. Caesar was the top leader, Crassus controlled the treasury, and Pompey was in charge of the accession of new territories. After having conquered Asia Minor, Syria, and Palestine, his next move was to visit Egypt. Before his death, Ptolemy XI placed his daughter Cleopatra and his son Ptolemy XII under the guardianship of the Roman Senate, and he had asked Pompey to come and do whatever was necessary to settle the problems arising in Egypt. A quarrel had developed between Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy XII concerning the throne of Egypt. Pompey was killed on his way to Egypt. So Julius Caesar went directly to Alexandria, and because of her great beauty, he began to champion the cause of Cleopatra, making her the queen of Egypt. Julius Caesar was fascinated by Cleopatra and entered into immoral relations with her. Despite this relationship, the scripture predicted in verse 17 that she would not stand for Caesar, but rather for her own interests. Verse 18 predicts the many conquests by Julius Caesar as he turned to the Isles. Historians give him credit for having fought and won 500 battles. He captured a thousand cities and in his conquest he killed over a million men. The latter part of verse 18 together with verse 19 predicted a conspiracy to bring about Caesar's death. Historians tell how Brutus posed as a friend both of the Roman Republic and of Julius Caesar. So on March 14, 44 BC, Brutus arranged for M. Lapidus, whom Caesar had appointed as governor of Gaul, to have dinner with Julius Caesar. Their discussion had to do with the kind of death most desirable. Caesar indicated that he would prefer sudden death. During the night, his wife had a dream, and the next morning, she begged her husband not to go to the Senate chamber. After some time, Brutus came and urged Julius Caesar to come because of many urgent matters demanding his attention. No sooner was he seated on his throne than the conspirators gathered around him, took their concealed daggers, and thrust them into his body so that he stumbled and fell forward, killed by 23 wounds. In verses 20 to 22, Gabriel made four predictions. Julius Caesar's successor would be a raiser of taxes. A vile person would become ruler. Tiberius would have military power, and Tiberius would have to do with the crucifixion of Jesus. Before his death, Julius Caesar appointed his nephew, Octavian, to be his successor. Julius had named July a month of the year, having 31 days after himself. Likewise, when Octavian became ruler, he took the name Augustus Caesar and named the month following July after himself. He added to it another day, which he took from February. He was truly a raiser of taxes. Read Luke chapter 2, verse 1. He used the tax funds to finance his great building enterprises all over the Roman Empire. During his reign, the Messiah was born. It was this taxation which brought Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem, even though they resided in Nazareth, where the Savior was born, as had been predicted in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. After the death of Augustus Caesar, a vile person was to rule. A short time before Augustus died, his wife urged that her son, by a former marriage, be appointed to succeed him. It was reported that Augustus thought Tiberius to be too vile a person to become the emperor. Since he had no son of his own, he appointed a very respected Roman citizen by the name of Agrippa to succeed him. However, whatever God says will come to pass because the scripture cannot be broken. John chapter 10 verse 35. What happened? Agrippa died before Augustus Caesar. His wife once again urged the appointment of Tiberius and because of flattery, he yielded and the prediction of God's word was fulfilled. Tiberius conducted many successful military campaigns in Germany and also the regions which lay to the east and east of Armenia and Parthia. In the spring of AD 31, while Tiberius was emperor for Rome, 
Pilate, the Roman ruler over Judea, ordered the crucifixion of Jesus the Messiah. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his fathers' fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and the spoil and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed of the portions of his meat shall destroy him. And his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table. But it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits, and return to his own land. At the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Verses 23 to 29. Here the controversy between Christ and Satan becomes more fierce. The Jews were the objects of oppression, the Roman yoke they despised. The rabbis had taught the people that the coming of the Messiah would put an end to, Roman, to Rome's iron rule. This doctrine, even though not taught in the scriptures, was readily received because they were tired of the taxation and oppression. Satan had been working behind the scenes to blind men's eyes to the kind of Messiah who had been promised. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 The verses being considered in this part of chapter 11 depict the development of the mystery of iniquity which the Apostle Paul saw at work in his day and which was destined to become full grown in opposition to the one true God. Read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 2 through 12. When the Messiah was put to death on, on a Roman cross, this dealt a death blow to Satan. Read Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. Satan no longer had access to heaven as a representative of this world. Job chapter 1 verses 6. But he was now cast down or refused access to these councils. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10, Luke chapter 10 verse 18. So the devil knew then that his time was short. Revelation chapter 12 verse 13. The birth of Jesus into human flesh is known as the incarnation. This is a mystery the human mind cannot fully comprehend. Satan has presented since that time the mystery of iniquity to deceive the elect if possible. Matthew chapter 24 verse 24. To stand successfully against the mystery of iniquity the Son of God must be permitted to dwell in the heart. The struggle between truth and error is greater during this period of the development of the mystery of iniquity than at any other time. For 300 years after Christ, there was a constant warfare between Christians and pagans. By the end of the third century, because of the power attending the proclamation of the gospel, the government of Rome was greatly weakened. By AD 312, Constantine the Great developed a new policy that resulted in the formation of the papacy and the union of church and state. At this time, Christians refused to fight under the banner of paganism. A league was entered into, and Constantine became a Christian. The cross became the symbol of Constantine's army. Here's the testimony of history from Gibbon. This same symbol sanctified the arms of the soldiers of Constantine. The cross glittered on their helmet, was engraved on their shields, was interwoven into their banners and the consecrated emblems which adorned the person of the emperor himself were distinguished only by the richer materials and more exquisite workmanship. Edward Gibbon, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire Edition of Oliphant Smeaton, Volume 1, pages 644-645 And the standard which was carried before this Christian army supported a crown of gold, which enclosed a mysterious monogram, at once expressive of the figure of the cross and the initial letters of the name of Christ page 645. What took place? The mystery of iniquity began to clothe paganism in Christian garments. This period has often been referred to by theologians as a time of baptized paganism. The Edict of Milan granted universal toleration. The first law regarding worship on Sunday was issued by Constantine in 321. Constantine called the first ecumenical council of Nice, Nice in 325 which resulted in the formation of a creed and Constantine attended this council 
Verses 23 and 24 describe the duplicitous character of Rome, her leaders, and her people. There was no lie, deceit, or chicanery that Rome would not stoop to in order to gain her desired ends. This distinguished her from the ruling nations that had preceded her. Her word meant nothing and could not be relied upon. The European colonizers of America displayed these same traits. These spiritual children of Rome lied through their teeth and made many treaties with the Native Americans, but they broke every last one of them. Professing themselves Bible-believing Christians, there was no lie or falsehood, theft or murder they would not commit. Thus they stole the Native Americans' land from them. No wonder the United States of America is described as having two horns like a lamb and speaking like a dragon in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. The Romans developed their empire by pledging help, but after making friends, they worked deceitfully. Read Daniel chapter 8, verses 24 and 25. To develop a strong empire, they attempted to do at this time that which had never been done before. Rome purchased the loyalty of her soldiers, governors, and officers, and senators. How? She gave them permission to overrun the provinces they ruled, and the Roman government helped them to secure new territory. Condition continued for a time. If this is considered prophetic time, it indicates that this would be one year or 360 prophetic days, which, when the rule of Bible prophetic time is applied, Ezekiel 4.6 would be 360 years. Augustus Caesar became the first Roman emperor with supreme power as a result of the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. There were exactly 360 years between 31 BC and AD 330 the year when Constantine moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople. When Constantine professed to be converted and became a member of the church, this brought about a union of church and state and the development of the papacy. When he died in AD 337, he left three things, a new capital, a new policy, a new religion. The papacy was well on its way to supremacy. In Alexandria, quite a controversy developed between Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, and Arius, a, pres a presbyter in Alexandria. It all came about because Christian schools began to adopt Greek philosophy. Higher criticism developed as an attempt was made to interpret the Bible according to human intellect. The controversy in the Christian world necessitated the Council of Nicaea in 325. This council recognized the creed of Athanasius to be orthodox. Arianism was considered heresy but it was popular among the barbarian tribes which invaded the Western Roman Empire. The followers of Arius included the Heruli and the Ostrogoths, which settled in Italy, and the Vandals, who settled in Africa. There was a great power struggle going on. If the papal power was ever to be supreme, it would be at the expense of uprooting the Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths. In verse 25, Gabriel goes back to the beginning of Roman rule. In 32 BC, Augustus Caesar waged a successful war against Cleopatra and Mark Antony, which resulted in their final defeat at Actium in 31 BC. Verse 26 indicated the real source of Mark Antony's problem was eternal. His soldiers were not happy with his relationship with Cleopatra, so, in a sense, as they left him there, was little if any hope for his survival. Finally, verse 27, Octavian, the leader called himself Augustus, and Antony got together and formed a friendship as Antony married the sister of Octavian. But this did not last long because Antony soon left his wife in favor of Cleopatra. In the latter part of verse 27, a universal principle re reiterated, The end of all things is in God's hands. All that men may do to accomplish certain goals must be subservient to the control of an almighty God. When men and governments think they have arrived, God says, the end shall be at the time appointed. The last two verses of this section, 28 and 29, refer to Octavian, Augustus Caesar, who, after his victory in Egypt, went to Rome for a great three-day victory celebration. Historians reveal that Augustus Caesar and his army at this time took a tremendous amount of riches from Egypt. It is evident that at heart, Augustus Caesar and the government he headed were in opposition to the Holy Covenant or God's plan of salvation. After the Egyptian victory, the next great siege by the Romans was directed against the Holy Land. The country and the cities which had been the place of Christ's early ministry were completely ravaged. Finally under Titus, Jerusalem, the Holy City, and its inhabitants met with a complete overthrow 
in AD 70. So this second returning is from the next major conquest after Egypt. That military campaign of Rome going down to Judah and ultimately destroying Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. Rome literally took away the daily sacrifice and cast down the place of the sanctuary. This is why his heart is against the Holy Covenant in the sense that he's going to destroy the temple, Jerusalem, and the people that once had been God's people or the people of the covenant. There is also here the prediction that pagan Rome, through her emperors, would do all in their power to oppose and to annihilate Christianity. There was a special attempt to do this during the awful persecutions against Christians for a 10 year period, AD 302 to 312. These persecutions began with Nero and ended with Diocletian. Finally, the seat of the Roman government was successfully transferred to Constantinople by Constantine the Great in AD 330. At the time appointed, the mystery of iniquity was making real headway in the overthrow of the Roman Empire. The time appointed, the end of the 360 years in AD 330, when the capital of the Roman Empire was moved from the city of Rome to Constantinople by Constantine, was the end of the supremacy of Rome. The 360 years of prophetic time had come to its close. And from that point on, the ability of Rome to control the world at will through its military might and its political prowess ceased. In AD 330, when he moved the capital, then all the problems began, began for Rome. It was immediately divided into east and west, and the western empire immediately comes under attack from the barbarians out of the north. The islands of the Mediterranean that Rome had formerly controlled now became launching points for some of the powers designed by God to bring Rome down and contribute to the event, to the environment needed for Rome to break up into the ten horns and the three horns to be removed as in Daniel 7. Former or latter means when Rome attempts to defend itself and maintain its authority from Constantinople, the new capital of the kingdom, he won't have the ability to be as successful in his military campaigns from that point on. It won't be as the former, like when he went into Egypt and dealt with Mark Antony and had such great success, nor will it be as the latter, when he went into Judea and destroyed the temple in AD 70 and wiped out Israel. He had success then, but from AD 330 onward, his military success wasn't going to be the same.